Proverbs 25, verse number one is our text. So if you would stand with me as we read our text, it says here, these are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. And let's pray. Father, we are thankful, uh, Lord, for your love for us. And Lord, we love you in return. I pray that as we study your word, that, <clears throat> Lord, that our love for you would be sparked and would be inflamed, would burn brightly tonight, and that we would desire to know you more, that we desire to follow you more. And uh, Lord, I just pray for your blessing on each one of us here tonight and on the decisions that we'll make regarding your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we are talking about wisdom's perpetuation because beginning in chapter 25 of Proverbs through the end of the book of Proverbs, uh, you have the, uh, the Proverbs of Solomon, but it's the Proverbs of Solomon that the men of Hezekiah had copied out. And so what, what we're finding as, as we go through this chapter and then through uh, the following chapters, we're finding that uh, the wisdom that's in the previous 24 chapters is continuing. Some of this is new material. Some of it is, is really drawn off previous material that's been shared. Uh, some of it is actually going to be word for word what was said previously. And we'll, we'll talk about those things when we get there. But what we're finding is wisdom continuing. It's being perpetuated. And we saw that through preservation in verse 1. Tonight, we're going to start in this second part, talk about potentates in verses 2 through 7. And we can see in uh, verses 2 and 3, the search of potentates. The search of potentates and, and potentates, again, it, that is a ruler, a leader. A lot of times it's applied to a dictator, but it can apply, be applied to an emperor or a king as well. And so that's how we're using it here. Uh, so when we see the search of potentates, we begin, first of all, with the glory of God in verse number two. The heaven for height, uh, I'm sorry, verse two. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So we see the search here. There's the glory of God that, that is uh, to begin with. And that's exactly where we ought to always begin is with the glory of God. If we were <clears throat> to live our life ignoring the glory of God or putting the glory of God secondary or third place, fourth place in, in our lives, how sad our lives would be. But as God's people, it is for us to do as Solomon did here and begin with the glory of God. Oh, but wait, this ruler, look how luxurious their life is and look how wonderful things are for them and look how grand their life is. But the glory of God is always, always greater. And so we begin with the glory of God. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, he says. And, and uh, look back over in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse number 29. And what we, what we learn in this verse is that God does reveal a great deal to us. As we study through the word of God, we learn more and more. And uh, we... we it, it is amazing, as we study the Word of God, all that God has incorporated in His Word. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. So God has revealed a great deal to us through his inspired and preserved word, like we talked about last week. He reveals a great deal to us. It, is, it belongs to us. What he's revealed to us belongs to us. Now, we, we know <clears throat> how children are. They tend to be pretty selfish. That's just how children are, especially if they have siblings. So... 
Uh, and I, I think I've told you before, I have a New Testament, a little pocket New Testament. It's about that big. <clears throat> and uh, I got that when I was three or four. My dad went on a trip and he brought that back. That was, that was my, my prize. That was my present. And, um, you know, I, I appreciated that. And I, I've been able to keep it all these years. Actually, my mom kept it up until not that many years ago. And then, then uh, I got it. But when you open up the front cover of that little New Testament, do you know what you find there? You don't find my name. You find my sister's name. And that's because when, when my sister saw how excited I was to have this New Testament, she wanted it. And so when I wasn't looking, when I wasn't in my room, she came in and took it, put it in her room and wrote her name on it so that she could say it was, it belongs to me. And of course that, that got all worked out because my dad had bought something else for her as, as a present. And so anyway, I got it back, but that's, that's always going to be in there as a reminder. But it was, you know, that, that's how little kids are. You know, they, they want mine, 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 it's mine. And, and they're desperate. You know, I've watched this. I've done it, you know, when I was young. You know, you, you get that desperation. They're going to take that away from me. How do we feel about the Word of God? Do we have that same kind of desperation when somebody talks down about the Word of God? <gasps> That's mine. Don't, don't do that to what is mine. That's, that's what he's saying. The things that God's revealed belong to us. It's for us. And we ought to be jealous over it. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean we ought to be protective of it and not, not just allow people to run it down and, and to, uh, to trash it, to misrepresent it. We ought to say, no. That's wrong. This, this is mine. Don't, don't treat my stuff that way. But while God has revealed a great deal about himself and his word, there's a lot about God that we don't know. We just do not know. And, and the reason, well, there's two reasons, I suppose we could say, why we don't know. Number one, God didn't tell us. Number two, our brains couldn't hold it. All right? That's just the truth of it. Because we are finite beings. We have limitations to our learning and our understanding. God is infinite. So we, we could never grasp God anyway. But God does hide things or shroud things about himself. Here in Job chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, we read, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Now, when he's saying unto perfection, he's not talking about sinlessness. He's talking about completely. Or, I mean, we have a lot of different sayings. To the nth degree, that, that's one that we, we used a lot uh, when I was younger. And, you know, do we understand God completely? That's what he's asking. Verse 8, uh, it is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? So he's saying, really knowing everything about God, it's as high as heaven. Can you do that? Everything about God is as deep as hell. Can you, can you go to that extent? No, we cannot do that. And so there are things that God has hidden about himself. And even though we, we do try, we study God's word to learn more about him. And yet there are always going to be some things that we don't know, uh, that we're not going to know this side of heaven. In Job 38, in verse number 4, God is speaking to Job. And here's what he says, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Well, how did it work? All we know is what Genesis 1 tells us. God spoke and it occurred. That's all we know. Well, how did it? We don't know because we weren't there. So that's what God's saying. You don't know. You, you, can, you can theorize and you can dream and you can imagine, but you don't know. God has shrouded that information about himself 
as the creator. Uh, he goes on here in uh, verse number five. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the fountains thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So he's saying, you know, what do you know? What do you know about any of these things that I've done? And the response is, we don't. There's no way for us to know. Because what he's talking about are things that happened before man created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That was on day one. Man wasn't created until day six. So how is man supposed to know what went on in day one and how it all worked? Like I said, there's a lot of theories. There's a lot of philosophies. There's a lot of things that, that people have imagined down through the centuries. But nobody was there. So nobody knows except for what God has revealed to us through his word. That's all we know. And so the rest of it, can we know everything about God? Well, you know, did God, like, when, when God spoke, did he have to shout? You know, like, like what you do with your kids to get their attention, you know? Do you have to, like, call them by, you know, did God have to call the earth by its middle name, you know, to, to, to make it show up? You know, those, those are, I mean, that's, that's a silly question. But the things about God, well, how does God, and how is this, and, and what about that? We don't know. God doesn't tell us everything in his word. And it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It is his glory. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more here in a second. But over in Romans chapter 11, we find that God exceeds the comprehension of our finite minds. And I already said that, but let's read this in Romans 11, 33 and 34. O oh, depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? What he's asking there when he says who's been his counselor, it, he's, he's saying, who sat down with God and God laid out his plan and said, this is what I'm thinking about doing. What do you think? Well, God doesn't do that with us. And so we can't understand all that God's doing. There are people who are, are in church and they're saved and then one thing will happen and they'll get out of church. And I'm not talking about a, a nice thing. There will be something negative happen. And sometimes it's a really big thing, sometimes it's not. But it, that's not the point. The point is that they'll get bitter. They get bitter against God. They get bitter against God's people. They get bitter against God's word. And they, they, they turn away from everything that is true and everything that's right. Now, are they right in doing that? No, they're not. And part of the reason that they are not right in doing that is because they don't know what God's doing. They have no idea. Well, why did this bad thing happen to me? You don't know what God's doing. I'll be honest with you. I've had some bad things happen in my life back, back down through the years. And if some of those bad things did not happen in my life where and when it did, I wouldn't be here today. So it is... So I can't stand back and, and be bitter against God. God, why did you allow that to happen? Because to some degree, you know, time has given me some understanding of why certain things have happened. And so now I see, okay, God allowed that to happen there to get me where I am today. But what many people do is they don't, they don't wait till later or just trust God and wait till heaven and, and then we'll know. They don't want to do that. Well, since I can't figure it out now, I'm just going to give up on God. I'm going to give up on church. And I'm going to say they're all a bunch of hypocrites. And, and there's, there's no use to even go. There's no use to even listen because God allowed something negative in my life. Well, see, the problem is God exceeds our imagination. We cannot comprehend him. 
We cannot comprehend the reason why God does things and why he does them the way he does. What we have to do is trust God and continue to follow him, even when we don't understand. And let's be honest, that's a lot of times that we don't understand. You know, people say something, why did they say that? We don't know. And sometimes people say things and there's a reason why they said things and there's a reason why they did things and we don't know. We just see the result. We, we hear the words, we see the action and then we come up with our own assumptions. Well, they must be, well, it has to be this and they, they have to be doing this and they have to be thinking that. We may be right and we may be totally wrong. We're wrong to assume. It's the same thing with God. We're wrong to assume and start blaming God and start crediting God with bad things, with bad motives. We're never going to understand God this side of heaven. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's the glory of God, really, that he is beyond our comprehension. If God were such that you and I could understand him, then he would not be any better than you or I. And that's not much of a God because I recognize I recognize my own finite nature. You know, you get up in the night and you stub your toe on the furniture. That's not God-like. It's not. You know, you would think if you're God, you'd know, hey, that's there. And you would step around it. Well, we're not godlike, are we? And that's why we go ahead and stick our toe right there where it doesn't belong. But that's the glory of God. It just shows how much greater God is than you and I. That he can conceal a thing. He can hide things about himself. He can hide things about us. He can hide things about situations that he puts us in. He can hide all of those things until his time. That's his glory. But he goes on here, back in uh, Proverbs 25, he goes on here, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So that's the honor of kings. And <clears throat> when we go back to uh, 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 9, we find Solomon praying to God, and he was an at least at this point in his life, an honorable king. He, <clears throat> he didn't say, God, let me know everything. He said, God, give me wisdom. And, and what does wisdom do? Wisdom helps us search out the right answer and the right way to go. And that's what Solomon prayed for here in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 9. Uh, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. And so he's praying for wisdom. That's honorable. That way, God, when things come before me, I can do what's right. I can know what's right to do. I can do what's right to do. And... Uh, it would be just and it would be the right thing for your people. Look over in the book of Ezra. I know, as I was studying, I found that uh, autocorrect had, had changed my notes uh, to the book of Ear. But I haven't found the book of Ear. I went looking for it. Uh, but the book of Ezra, chapter 4. Here we find the practice of an honorable king. And this... This is a heathen king. This is not a believer. It's not a Christian king. And yet, he's still honorable in what he did. And that's, that's why we're using him in this illustration. Uh, he accepts requests to search out a matter. He wasn't, well, I'm the king. Don't ask me to look that up. He wasn't so full of himself that he wouldn't go and find out. Well, is this true or is this not true? That's really the sign of a good leader. But here in Ezra chapter 4 and verse number 15, uh, uh, that search may be made in the books of the records of thy fathers, 
so shalt thou find in the book of the records, and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful to kings and provinces, and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time, for which cause was this city destroyed? So they asked him, please go search. And in, in verse 19, you have the king's response. And I commanded, and search hath been made, and it is found that this city of old time hath made insurrection against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. So they requested, would you search this out? Find out if this is true or not. And so he did that, and he found out that that was the case, and he was the right kind of king, and that he actually responded, and he admitted, yes, I did the search, and here's what I found. And so he accepted a request to search out a matter, but when we go over to chapter 5 and verse 17, we see that in, in the practice of uh, an honorable king, that that honorable king will agree to search beyond the surface. So now he's already made this search, and the Jews go back and say, now, would you do a search for this, which would trump the initial search? In other words, it would reverse the decision that was made based on the first search. And so they, they asked, would you go do that? You know... <laughs> A lot of us would say, no, I've already searched. I've already found this. I'm not going to look anymore. Quit wasting my time. But the honorable king says, you know what? I want to do the right thing. And so, yes, I've searched and I've learned this, but maybe there's something I missed. So let me go search again and a little bit more specifically. Here in uh, Ezra 5 and verse 17, now therefore... If it seem good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so, that a decree was made of Cyrus the king to build this house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. Go on to the next verse. Uh, then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. So this is an example to us of an honorable king. It's an honor for a king to search out a matter, not just to say, well, I already know all that. I, you, you know, there's, there's nothing you can tell me. There's nothing you could ask me. Uh, I, I know it all. I'm the king. How do you think I got to be the king? Instead of having that sort of attitude, the honorable king says, I will look into it, and then looks into it. And then later, will look further into it if, if need be. That is the honor of kings. In verse number three, uh, we see the heart of kings. In uh, Proverbs 25, three, the heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. So Solomon here set forward three things that are unsearchable. Now we've already talked about God, so we're not talking about God being unsearchable. That's already dealt with, but he's talking about other things that are unsearchable. Number one of those three things is the height of the heavens. The height of the heavens. How, now, you know, we, we have, when, when I took science in school, and I, I suppose most of you had the same thing, we were taught, you know, the clouds are about this far above the Earth's surface. And then the atmosphere, which is our, our, our Earth's atmosphere, is about this much higher and then beyond that is space. And um, do any of you remember, if you can remember back that far, can you remember anybody saying how far away the edge of space is? Why? Because they don't know. There, there are actually two things uh, that, that we have that, that science tells us. And actually, it's, it's quite interesting. What science tells us now about space is what the Word of God has told us all along which sort of says you should have read the Bible in the first place because God knows. But anyway, number one, uh, num number one is they can't find an edge. And number two, according to science, space is expanding. And that is what the, the Word of God teaches. It's expanding. Well, so we can't measure it, can we? 
So the height of the heavens then is unsearchable. And um, so any, anyway, let, let's, let's go on here and, and consider this. The theory of the flat earth, which I've known, I've, I've known a lot of people that, that have that, uh, that adhere to that theory. They, they say that, um, they say that the limit of the heavens or the firmament in which all the stars and planets are everything, everything over, you know, the, the dome over the flat earth, uh, everything is encapsulated within that firmament, that dome, and that dome is between 96 and 120 kilometers above the earth. That's what they say. I've heard them say it. You know, they say, hey, watch, watch this video clip. It's going to really convince you. And so that's what that video clip said. You know, it's 70 miles above the earth. And so they're saying all these different things. Fine, 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 fine. However, if their theory were true, then this scripture is a lie. What does it say? The heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. If the dome in which all of the heavens are encased is known, if the height of it is known, this verse is lying to us. I do not want to be guilty of accusing God of lying. I don't want to do that. And so when it says the heaven for height, that it is unsearchable, you know what I believe? I believe that the heaven for height is unsearchable, that we're not going to find. How high does it go? We're not going to find that out. We're, we're not ever... I mean, not, not in this lifetime are we going to know. Uh, what, what we find, look, look over in Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And when we think about the unsearchable height of the heavens, it gives us a lesson in the mercy of God. In Psalm 103, in verse number 11, we read, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Now you think about it, if, if the heavens have a limit of 120 kilometers, then we can measure the mercy of God, according to this verse. Because as the one, what, what, what the psalmist is telling us is, just as the heavens are unsearchable, that are, are immeasurable, so is God's mercy. There's a lesson there. The heavens for height is unsearchable. So is God's mercy for you and I. And remember, mercy is not receiving what we deserve. Do you know how true that is? I, I've, you know, I've, I've said many, many times, talked about when, when I was saved, I was saved as a 10-year-old boy. But do you know how many times I sinned? I don't either. I, I didn't keep count. God, God knows. But the thing is, God gave me mercy every time. What he should have done is he should have judged me the first time I sinned. That's what would have been just. But God's mercy said, no, I'll wait. I'll give him the opportunity to repent. I'll give him the opportunity to place his faith in my son. And so how, how many times did God extend to me mercy? As many times as I sinned, and then some. God's mercy is immeasurable. Also, when, uh, when we look over to Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9, the unsearchable heights of the heavens give us a lesson in the unsearchableness of God himself. We already mentioned this, but we want to reiterate that. If, if you can figure out how big the expanse of space is, then you can figure out God. Now, they're, they're, you know, they're scientists, they theorize, they, they propo propose this theory. Well, I think it's you know, this many light years across, whatever. But if, if space is expanding, as, as they say, and as the Word of God teaches, then 
they might have been right when they said it, but by the time they got it out of their mouth, it would have been wrong because space is expanding. You see what I'm saying? And they're, they're never going to get it all figured out. But Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's how much greater God is than you or I. For us, look, we should never be guilty of trying to put God on the same level that we're in. We should never do that. We don't want to bring God down to our level. He's too great a God for us to do that. He's immeasurable. We can't figure out how great He is and how, how, how much greater is God than man. Well, people might want to figure that out. They might want to claim that they know, but we don't know. We don't know. So anyway, back, back here, it says, The heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. So the earth for depth. Now, men have never searched the depths of the earth. Yeah, they're bad people and they're going to hurt the kingdom. And I'll give you 50 bucks and let's kill them all. That was more than 50 bucks that he offered. But th that was sort of the idea that Haman was playing under. And it seemed initially that the king of Persia was going to listen to everything that Haman had to say. But what was the end result? The end result was that Haman was hanged, that the Jews were not slaughtered, and the king went on. And so this, this idea of, of being able to manipulate those in leadership, the hearts of kings, or the hearts of the king, is unsearchable. You may think that you're getting away for a, a, a period of time, and, and you're getting your own way, and you're able to manipulate this one or that one. But in the end, it may not turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. You know, what, what happens when, when you make friends? You know, I've, I've, got, I've got friends in elected office, you know, and they've been in, in elected office for all these years, and man, all I've got to do is make a phone call, and, and you're going to be in hot water with the government, and blah, blah, blah. What happens next election? and they get voted out of office. Then what happened to all that, all that help that you thought you were going to have? It's gone. It's gone. The heart of the king is unsearchable. But also, I, when, when you talk about the administration of government, does anybody understand the administration of government, especially when you look at the bureaucracy? So you elect a government, and that government says, here's our platform. The bureaucracy stands back and says, well, it's not ours. And so they go ahead and do whatever they're going to do, regardless of what Parliament is doing. They're passing these laws, and, and the bureaucrats are continuing doing whatever it is they're doing over here. And as the saying goes, never the twain shall meet. So we, when, when we're talking about the heart of kings is unsearchable, we, we can apply that to the administration of government. You say, well, I read the law, it says this. Oh yeah, but... And, and this is one thing that I've dealt with over the years, when you're talking about immigration, okay, what does immigration mean? I've read immigration law. I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying anything like that. But what I am saying is I tried to do my due diligence and find out what the law said. But when it came to experience, experience and what the law said was not always the same thing. And I'll tell you something else. When you hit the border and you talk to the border agent, it depends on who you're talking to and what mood they're in, what they tell you. Okay, well, how do I do this with immigration? How do I do this with immigration? Some will tell you one thing, some will tell you another. Now, the law, it reads the same way no matter how many times you read it. But the administration of it is altogether different. Uh, and, and so... What does that mean? It means it's unsearchable. So that means, in, in my illustration, when you come to the border, you don't know what to expect. You can know the law backward and forward. You can quote it. It doesn't matter. If they want to say something or they want to do something a different way, that's how it's going to be. You, you, you got no choices uh, in, in that situation. So it's past finding out. 
what would we, if the heart of the king is past finding out, so we, we can't figure out government. And the heavens, we can't figure out the height of the heavens. We can't figure out what all is, is involved in the depths of the earth. And we can't figure out God. All of those things are true. All of those things we've talked about in, in these two verses. Which then should be the one that we should be the most attuned to? In other words, which one should we follow? Should we follow after those who are exploring space? Should we follow after those who are exploring our world? Should we follow after those who are exploring politics? Or should we follow after God? You see, none of those are we going to find out everything about, but which is the one that is going to... to make an eternal difference in your life and can use you to make an eternal difference in somebody else's life. Who is that? Can the government do that? No. Can those who study space do that? Can those who study the world do that? No. Only God can. So while they're all past finding out, there's one that is far more uh, reliable and far better for us to, the, the old saying is, hitch our wagon to. You know, there's some people, you know, you're talking about studying space and studying the world. A lot of that has to do with science. And it, it's funny because science does, they talk about, like I said, space expanding. Well, the Bible talks about that. There's no problem with that, is there? However, scientists will throw out other things. The, 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 and, and they throw out theories. Like, well, oh, well, I think this. Great. I think things too. But that's, that's called an opinion, right? With, with all of that that's changing, you can't trust it. It's unsearchable. Because you have this group over here, they believe this. You have this group over there, they believe that. You have all these different ideas, all these different philosophies. Nobody, nobody really agrees. They talk about a consensus, but when you really break it down... There's really not a lot of consensus. I'm talking in, in, in science and so on. When, to talk, when you're talking about politics, in some ways you don't want a consensus. Because what, what we have now is a real push toward a one world government. What, what, do, what is that all about? It's all about having a consensus that we need to be able to globally respond to X, Y, and Z you know, we, to respond to the next pandemic. That's the thing they're talking about now. But they're also talking about this, this is how we're going to uh, uh, respond to uh, global famine. And, and this is how we're going to respond to global situations with a one world government. Well, we don't want consensus that way. Because what, what's really going on with all that is it's setting up for the government of Antichrist, which will be a one world government. So I'm, I'm not for that. I'm not for that at all. I'm not saying, you know, just ignore everybody else, but I am saying let, let's use our own heads instead of letting some other head somewhere else make, make all the decisions. We can hitch our wagon to both of those things, to science wherein there's no consensus, to politics where they want a consensus, but we would rather them not, or we can hitch our wagon to God. And there will never be a consensus when it comes to God either. Because there are all kinds of people who have all sorts of ideas about God too. The only thing that we know to be true, as far as God is concerned, is from the word of God. If we will hitch our wagon to God and what we can find in his word, we're not going to go wrong. Now, the world may say we've gone nuts. But we're not going to go wrong hitching our wagon to God and following after him. Oh, but I, I don't know what God's doing, but I don't, I don't know how this is all going to work out. He's far more trustworthy than anything else. So while we can't figure out God, we do know who he is. We know what he's done. We know how he loves us. 
We know how He's been merciful to us. I don't see anybody else loving us and showing us mercy like God has. He's well worthy of our attention, of our focus, of our study, and of our love. He's worthy of that. Let's stand together with our heads bowed, eyes closed tonight.